Good morning, and thank you very much for organizing this important conference and for inviting me. What I'm talking today, um, I'm talking about today, is not really about economic teaching. That's uh, what I do for the last two years, but I want to uh, kind of dig a bit deeper. So what I'm going to talk about is the demise of political economy, um, which happened about 120 years ago, or 130 years ago, back in the 19th century. And what I'm talking, why I'm talking about this kind of old stuff. Um, you know about pluralist uh, economics, and uh, I think we attempt now, at least since 2009, to create a real uh, pluralist perspectives, and we always see that we are kind of stuck uh, in a very mathematical approach in the mainstream of economics, um, and also in a very objective stance uh, against uh, what we try to search on. And I want to show you that there's uh, some reasons for this, uh, which date back, like 120 years, and where, where, where there was a time where our maps, our cognitive maps, have been shaped um, and have been established since in a very, very hard-fashioned way. What I'm going to do with you is first I talk a bit uh, about cognitive mapping and mental infrastructures to see why we are so, um, why our thinking cannot be broadened um, anymore. And then I'm sure going to show you how um, political economy has come to a full stop, has come to an end um, in, uh, at the turning of the um, 19th century. And I'm going to show you what kind of, uh, what political economy has been before neoclassical economics took place or took over, and to show that a lot of things that you wish for pluralist economics today has been um, in existence since then and has been then um, erased from economic thinking. And then I'm going to talk about concepts of pluralism and what it means for us uh, today. Um, you might be familiar uh, we, with uh, Varian Hall. It's one of the most important economic textbooks. You might have used it in your universities. And as many other economists, uh, he talks about um, models, economic models uh, being like maps. And he talks about uh, how useless a map would be if it was uh, on a one-to-one -one scale. And he says, well, models um, are trying to eliminate irrelevant detail of economic reality and also to focus on the essential things. And as always happens in economic textbooks, it occurs like a natural event. It occurs that it would be very obvious what is irrelevant and what is essential of economic reality. Um, that we want to understand. And um, usually when you go to economic classes, you're taking like a consumer. So you're given some maps, uh, but nobody really tells you how to create those maps and how they were created and why things were deemed uh, essential or irrele irrelevant. And we have a whole, in, in uh, cognitive theory now, we have a whole branch of, uh, um, of science um, that really tries to understand how cognitive maps are shaped and uh, how they come into place and how they are transferred uh, from generation to generation. And here, three, at least three things are very important. Um, that maps never, ever reproduce reality, not even physical maps, but they are always powerful images. And you might know as we, now when you rely on GPS systems uh, and maps that are created by them, that you really totally rely um, on the mapping and even uh, blank out reality. So for example, um, I come from the River Rhine, I live in Bonn, and there's one, um, ferry across the Rhine, but a lot of GPS systems uh, uh, make you think there's a bridge. And it happens that a lot of cars just go on into the Rhine because they just look on the GPS system. And um, it always creates quite a kind of uh, chaos. And of course you can um, improve maps, 
but you could also improve um, people uh, really looking out of the window and check reality um, against images. And this is what I want to do with you, is just really to show, uh, show where these maps come from and what they uh, really uh, blank out from reality. So maps uh, shape real-world behavior. Um, so, if, for example, if you come to Vienna, you're quite likely to see a map first and then explore reality. And, of course, if a map guides you to this place, you always uh, blank out a quite a lot of other things in Vienna. And as I said before, um, in economics, you should be trained to produce cards, but not to consume cards. Yeah? So it should be a creative act uh, to create your own modeling. So how, do, how are cognitive maps uh, um, acquired? Um, of, of course, maps, uh, cognitive maps are not like real geographical maps, um, but they are more like inter mental infrastructures. Uh, and here's from Marvin Minsky, he's one of the first uh, exploring these mental maps and the frames, as they are also called. And they say, well, it depends on language you use, um, but also on teaching, on family and general culture. And here I want to uh, talk about this, how mental maps have been shaped for over 150 years of economic thought. Um, usually when we talk about mental maps or frames or stereotypes, as they are also uh, called, um, we are talking about three different layers of consciousness. And I'll come back to this to show you what is really consciously trained in mainstream economic uh, thought, which is also pre-conscious. Pre-conscious means that you're usually not aware of, but if you are asked, as you say, why, uh, how do you do this, uh, why do you... Uh, calculate things in a way, why do you use a special model, then you are able to give an answer. But there are also um, uh, method uh, presuppositions, uh, analytical presuppositions, philosophical presuppositions that a whole uh, generation of theorists cannot um, express any anymore. So all language and all mathematical reflection is based on those assumptions but they usually cannot talk about it anymore. So this is called implicit knowledge. And what I try to show you is some research and how to, uh, to get into this uh, unconscious space, um, like this iceberg model, how to get into this unconscious base that is now usually completely hidden uh, from our um, explicit thought and, and dialogue. And I'm not going to give you an introduction into these methods. You can, can talk about this later if you wish to. Um, it's uh, called frame semantics and frame analysis. And it's using language um, and language analysis to show how this unconscious space has been shaped. And usually you have two different kinds of text you can analyze to do this. It is when you first come into contact with uh, economics, if you start a, uh, studying a subject, then you are trained, um, you are reframed, your frames uh, uh, reshaped by what you learn, and there you can see or you can analyze how these unconscious beliefs are shaped. And the more fruitful uh, way, as I see it, is really to go back where, at the, for the first time, a um, concept of uh, science um, erased. And this is what I'm trying to show you now, is really to see how can we dig into old texts, where for the first time, people tried to explain why economics should become mathematical, should become objective, should become a real um, science. And I'm... You can do this with a lot of text. I'm just showing you two different ones um, for, the, for the next minutes or so. Um, it's um, the, um, uh, the text of Leon Walras. It's a French um, philosopher, French Swiss uh, philosopher, and the principles of economics um, by Alfred Marshall. And, and they get discussed like in the first sections. I don't who's familiar with these texts. Okay, so, so um, just for those who are familiar, 
and to everyone else, of course, as well. Um, you have texts that are really going into mathematics, especially Leon Walras is just calculating. It just takes him about 80 pages, but he uses language to explain why it is just useful to do so, or legitimate to do so, for about 80, uh, 80 pages or so. And this is what I have been analyzing, and it's about the same for Alfred Marshall. And both texts, uh, especially Leon Walras, uh, shows what political economy um, has been like uh, before he completely changes it into a mathematical science. And taking out of these texts, uh, it's a, a technical uh, process that tries to find the questions that are asked. These uh, are called slots in frame analysis and to see how these questions, the dominant questions, have been given different answers to. So these are, um, uh, these are the questions, what is the general theme, what's the general motivation, what's the general goal, and so on. And it has been, uh, political economy has been a pluralist, um, a pluralist, uh, subject or science because it's at least divided into two different parts that are interchanging. And usually if you're in frame analysis we talk about deep layer that is because of these models of unconsciousness. Um, uh, we're talking about basic assumptions so this is, you have to read it like this, it just goes from here uh, upwards. So it's a, a bit of kind of unusual reading. Um, so what is the general theme of politi political economy, wealth of nations, and so on? It's a, a pretty obvious uh, we're talking about social wealth, and we even talk in the new part of neoclassical economics, we are talking still about a kind of social wealth. The motivation that has been um, in place uh, until about 1880, um, 1880 was a very practical one. So political economy was there to provide plentiful revenue for the people, and there was really like material well-being, practical expediency, and so on. It was really about hunger, about starvation, about transportation, about trade, and so on. So it was a really a kind of down-to-earth uh, science. And on the other side, it was to provide plentiful revenue for the state, um, so it was um, uh, either in dem democracies or rising democracies uh, or questions, of course, uh, for monarchs and so on. And here it was also like, um, how can we care for the basic systems people need to live together? We had a different goals, uh, the one being material advantage on the one side and the other was uh, justice, fairness and equity, which is quite interesting that it was m the most part of political economy was thus just a moral science. The role model, um, if you talk about it, how should a econ political economist should like, was more like a practical people, like architects, navigators, and so on, and the activities has been advising, directing, controlling, prescribing. So this is what you can read as the basic answers uh, given to these uh, framework questions. And it was, um, it was a science that was not directly for the people, which should be interesting for you, talking about common, uh, good economy, uh, commons and so on. It has not been included into political economy so far. It was uh, very clearly just for statement, uh, statesmen, for legislators, but it was a science that was meant to dialogue um, so they knew that uh, economists, political economists knew until then that they had really to convince and to argue with other people. So, for example, rhetoric wa wa was part um, of the education of political econ economists um, on that time. And then you have two different criteria. The one is a moral one, it's goodness, and the other, other one is usefulness. And um, they explicitly talk about political economy being an art, in a sense of a practical science and ethics, moral science, which has been, as you know, um, uh, the case, for example, for Adam Smith having a chair for moral science, moral philosophy. 
And now something very interesting happens that economics, the new branch, which is called neoclassical economics, has nothing to do with what has been in place, a political economy, but it's something completely, um, completely different. So the question is, why do we have mathematics today? Why do we calculate? Why do we use formal models? And it's not that it was a better description of reality or something like this, but it had a completely different goal, which is here given the name of pure science. So it has a completely new, new role model. It was the astronomer. Uh, it was like just really very uh, calculating, very distant uh, courses of life and so on. And um, so, so the uh, motivation was to become a science in the strictest sense of the word, to be a science like physics, like mathematics, uh, and so on. And the goal was to pursue and master purely scientific truth. So it was really to get out of the real world, to get out of moral questions, and really to behave like a mathematician or like a physicist. And so the activities really changed. It was not uh, dialoguing anymore, uh, controlling, prescribing, but observing, verifying, explaining, identifying, and uh, later on calculating. And interestingly, uh, for a neoclassical economics, there's no target audi audience um, besides the economists themselves. So um, Leon Walras talks about a science uh, for its own sake. So it's completely closed off. It goes into its uh, um, ivory tower. And this is really done on purpose, because now sometimes you think, well, it's so um, out of this world. It's so enclosed in its ivory tower. But this was done on purpose, so it was really like uh, the, um, the basic sense and means of um, science. And what is interesting, um, that uh, from, from a frame semantic perspective, that you really have something dividing these two uh, different um, areas, political economy on the one side, pure science on the other side, um, by what, uh, what is a cognitive barrier, you are not sharing any kind of, um, uh, of, um, of scientific activities anymore. It's completely different. You don't have any uh, goals uh, that you share and so on. And so what we have today, if you think about uh, a very abstract form of economics that uh, relies on models, there's nothing you can share to just kind of go back to political economy. Um, now, I'm showing you a text that is only like 10 years or even seven years later, and something very interesting happens already in the stage. I'm now changing to Alfred Marshall. Um, he is now far better to describe what pure science should be, um, should be precise, exact, um, not only uh, true anymore, and there's a whole more a whole world of new role models opens up. He talks about mathematicians, biology, chemistry, and so on. Um, but what is completely or almost completely lost is the left part of what I've shown you. He's not talking about political economy anymore. He's not even able to express uh, what should be banned or what should be extinguished. But he doesn't use anything anymore. And interestingly, the, the um, political economy as an art and as an ethics is uh, banned into what you can call an unscientific common sense. So if we're talking about morality and say, well, economic education cannot make you a better person or more moral person, and we cannot even express anything about these questions. Um, it's just, we are just like a, like a man on the street or a politician, so there's nothing we can do about these questions, which is quite interesting because prior to this, political economy has been basically, as I said before, a moral science. And what is also interesting that especially moral science it comes to be like, a, um, like the enemy 
uh, which is now today uh, the same thing as you look at economic textbooks, they call you, it's not a normative science, and they cannot say anything about normative, normativity and so on. It has the root back into these um, texts. And which is also interesting uh, that uh, nobody understands today, as uh, Alfred Marshall didn't um, as well, uh, what a practical science is. Practical science is not an applied science. Um, but here is now what is applied science is you first do your models and then you act based upon the knowledge you gain from those abstract models. Prior to this, in political economy, we didn't have any mathematical mo models. So it was a real practical science getting out, for example, as um, uh, as Mill did, and really to understand why there's starvation, to use statistics, to talk to people out on the street, to talk to politicians and so on, to get a real um, picture about what happens and then to give advice and to uh, prescribe. And here now, we don't have any understanding of a practical science as it is, but, all, but only on applied science. And applied science always comes after doing um, modeling, doing mathematical economics. And so it is today that you first has to have to study about two, three, four semesters, just abstract knowledge. And they always say, well, you come to it later. You can apply it later. And here you can see that this was done on purpose in, um, in the rise of uh, neoclassical economics. Uh, and because of this, um, what uh, uh, Walras did is to say, well, we have a political economy that has three sub-disciplines, art, ethics, and pure science, and um, Marshall is now doing something uh, different, and he uh, says that we should shun, that we should um, eliminate political economy, and he created a new and an artif artificial and to that time unknown term, and this is economics. Yeah, so this is, um, here is uh, like the uh, quotation, but it, economics, shuns many political issues which the practical man cannot ignore. Um, and is therefore a science, pure and applied, rather than a science and an art. And is better described by the broad term economics than by the narrow term political economy. Yeah, so here again, if you talk about pluralist economics uh, from a historical point of view, um, as I would say, it's a bit um, difficult because you shun political economy in the um, earlier term and those uh, economics or economy, political economy as a practical science and a moral science. Here's now um, something different. I'm first talk, I've been talking about the motivation. Why do you have political economy in the, first, um, in the first place? And now the question is, what themes, uh, what issues you can treat uh, by studying political economics or neoclassical economics or economics in its narrow term? And here again is a uh, frame analysis from Leon Walras, Elements of Pure Economics. And he starts off... Um, with kind of uh, philosophical um, ideas that uh, you study corporeal identities, this is all things that are by nature changing and are those not constant and, and so on. And so he, th he says that in art and ethics we have to do with human phenomena because human phenomena is such uh, changing. And why are they changing? because of the free will of human people, because they can change every life circumstances they are in. So here we have a part, political economy has been to study um, free will, self-conscious independent forces, forces that are free and cognitive. And you can have this in two different kinds. So you have um, free will that is dealing with uh, things that do not have any free will. Um, so this is human action in respect to natural forces, 
and uh, this is about then about production of wealth, agriculture, industry, and trade. And you also have a free where you have places in the, in the economy where you have to interrelate free will and free will of different persons. So you have two relations between persons that are free and cognitive, and then you have to mutually coordinate ends and aims. And this is what he calls ethics. Yeah. So the whole branch of how people that uh, can have a different opinion, that have a free will, how they can coordinate their relation to nature, and how they can coordinate the relationships to themselves has been the main topic um, of political economy prior to neoclassical economics. And now he's doing something very interesting. And so what we don't have to do in, in neoclassical economics, we don't have to do anything uh, with the free will of people anymore. And this is very explicit. So he says, well, what a real science can only deal with, this comes from Plato and, and whatever, um, are universals, so the unchanging part uh, of, um, of the universe. And these, by definition, are natural. So natural is called things that are unchanging. And these are just, um, uh, they are just laws to be explored and laws that, that you cannot change by human will. So we're talking about the interplay of blind and ineluctable forces. This has been the state of the art in the physical sciences uh, in, at that time. And now it's very interesting that Valerius tries to, ex uh, to apply it to uh, something within the human economy. And this is why there are question marks here it has never been explained how this should really work for economics. So it's like a, um, it's a blind spot, and I haven't found any text who has explained it better than Leon Virus. So we just think that we can deal with natural phenomena within the human economy, but we can, cannot really explain what should that be. And he's then just proposing that these natural phenomena can be found in the sphere of exchange and in the value of exchange, in the factual expressions of value. But this has never been shown, it's just a presupposition. So for the question is, if you look at your modern textbooks today, why are you just dealing with markets uh, and prices and quantities it's because of this basic assumptions that you have to, to deal with universals, with the unchanging universals, but why they should be uh, incorporated in, um, in dealings of exchange has never been explicitly um, explained. It's just presupposed and now unconsciously um, used. Again, you can see that they don't share anything anymore, so it's a a kind of complete new paradigm that is arising here, and there are no uh, ki um, no attitudes, uh, no knowledge, no knowledge that you um, uh, have to share. I'm just showing it here uh, um, some developments that have um, occurred since then, for people like Jevons, Edgeworth, and so on. So they're just uh, packing layers on this now. So value in exchange, prices, quantities, and then the mathematical expressions of prices and quantities. This is what you have today in the modern textbooks, but you are not conscious of what has been, like the uh, philosophical foundations, you are not consciously aware of. And this is like the completely uh, blacked out, what you call in frame semantic analysis, uh, you call hypocognition, the hypercognition is if, is if something is not even talked about it anymore. Um, it's just completely blanked out. And usually if something is not trained, not talked about, not dialogued on, then it um, is just uh, passes out of cognition, pass out of your brain, and you cannot even uh, talk about it or even um, be aware of it anymore. So um, starting, so we talk about Jevons Edgeworth, it's uh, just about 80, 90. Um, we do not, do not have any explicit knowledge of the basic assumptions anymore. They're not talking about the motivation or hardly about it, and they just talk about 
the upper layers of thematic, uh, thematical uh, themes, um, which are all mathematical. mathematical. So um, what, why are this important? I mean, it doesn't really matter if people are just doing this 130 years ago, but it really has impact on what happens uh, today, as I would at least uh, propose, because this is basically what you still have in economic textbooks today. You're trained in the mathematical expressions, you're not trained in an art or in an ethics, and you're not told uh, why this should be the case. So if you, if you look at this uh, frame semantic iceberg model, as it's called, again, what you have on the top layer, what you can always see and what you can always um, uh, judge is um, that you're highly trained in knowledge of prices and quantities and their relations, and you are used to the practice of mathematical reasoning. You can do it, and everyone can see that you can do it. Um, but always, um, uh, already on the pre-conscious level, you're not really uh, able to say why it should be the case and what was, what has been, or what should be the alternative. And completely buried and uh, buried in the unconscious is like the philosophical presumptions I've been talking about, and the motivation. And the motivation is uh, sometimes it's quite funny if people ask why uh, we have to calculate the world. It is said it's like uh, the reality or something like this. But the really motivation is why we have a mathematical science today is because we wanted to have a mathematical science. And we look at the world because we wanted to have a pure science and we don't have a pure science because it's a real world. It's better um, uh, or you more useful to describe the real world. So the basic idea here is that uh, or, um, talking about this iceberg again is that you really have 90% um, of knowledge beneath the level of consciousness. And I, what I would argue is if you really want to have a, a plural um, economics, then you can have it at least in two different ways. The first is what I would call a horizontal pluralism. Of course, you can have ever and ever more knowledge of mathematical relations. You can have more models, you can have more formality, and so on. And I would really say, well, it's kind of pluralism. It's, it's all right, um, but it shouldn't be like the end of the story. And what I would say is that what we need uh, to have really a pluralist um, economy is to have a kind of verticality in it so that we are really able, by means of um, scientific reflection, philosophical reflection, and especially economic education, so that we can really go into these deep uh, layers uh, that has been hidden from our consciousness for a long time uh, in order to see that there's a real diversity to be explored, at least in three different ways. If you talk about a pure science, if you talk about an art or if you talk about an ethics, something, so, something very different. But I would argue that we should go back to Leon Walras and say that they are all part of political economy. Yeah? So, and uh, what I think is not enough is really to base the pluralism on the narrow term economics, as Alfred Marshall has told us back in 1819. 1890, sorry. So for me, there's no real pluralism without a vertical, critical, and philosophical reflection on the presuppositions of economics. This is what I've tried to show you uh, in uh, uh, roughly in this presentation. No real pluralism without a revival of the old polit political economy as moral and practical science. And there's no real pluralism without creating then a new political economy to meet the challenges of today's global economy and the survival of mankind and of uh, obviously nature. Um, so the, th the um, third part I think is very important here because obviously if you just go back to political economy as it was in the 19th century, we are not able to deal with the problems we have in our, in our world today. 
So if we really want to have a political economy, a revival of political economy um, as an art and as an uh, ethics, then we really have to see how it can deal with the present uh, world. So it ca it's not just like going back, uh, back to the roots or going back on the tree or whatever, um, uh, but really to see that it can uh, become a global, um, uh, or can, can be fit uh, for our problems of today. And this is um, uh, talking about economic education, like last point. Um, this is now what we have done at Kosanus Hochschule, and just not talking about everything, um, but just about the red part, uh, what we call Wissenschaftswende, so uh, making new of, uh, of, of uh, economics or political economy. And we said, first of all, we're not talking about economics or economic anymore, because from a historical and systematic point of view, it's just too narrow. And so we talk about a political economy, and it should pay at least fourfold. It should be like going back to, um, to the old political economist, like being practical and moral, and then to be critical and philosoph philosophical, to really see what happens with today's economics and its real world impacts. And then um, on a fourth point is to bring it into the 21st century and in order to have a transformative science that can really make a change today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. I'm sure there's a lot of questions in the room, but we actually realized if we want to take your questions, we need two microphones to be in the room, so I have to check whether I can use a third one. You cannot think about your questions meanwhile. <laughs> it's also good. Hello? Yeah. Ah, perfect. All right, so I used. This is slightly awkward, <laughs> but it should be fine. Okay. I think we'll take a round of questions and then answer them in turn. So, see one question over there, so maybe we start with you. Um, thank you very much for this presentation, this keynote. I would have one question regarding this transition from political economy to this new, new term economics. I mean, apparently the now called scientists became very narrow, so how did this transition actually become place as they were maybe no longer capable to actually give a very holistic advice for statesmen? So how were statesmen actually willing to, um, yeah, to take part or participate in this transition? Thanks very much, I'm here in the middle. Um, my question is the opposite end of that one, and that is um, now that we are in this fix with um, only scientific um, data-based, um, number-based um, rationalities being seen as valuable, how do we get back to um, statesmen and political actors being interested in um, philosophical narrative and um, conceptual um, analyses as part of their, um, how to make policy, for example? Maybe a third one? Oh, yeah, up there. <laughs> Hello. Uh, one question I had, uh, it's about kind of the, the transition also from political economy to economics. And my question would be, what was the role of the emergence of other disciplines there that might have taken on different parts of what used to be political economy? And then kind of follow-up question is whether you think it is whether it's you might you might have to bring this back to economics or it's kind of the heretics question but since I, I would say that some of those things that are political economy are carried out at other science sociology geography how much worth is really the fight to do that in economics or is just to a certain extent especially after financial crisis economics losing a little bit of its significance at the uh, at the favor of other disciplines Just trying to find the right slide. Uh, 
Um, so it's really interesting uh, questions. Why did statesmen just kind of follow? And for, uh, very basic answer at first is they didn't. So like Leon Valras and um, especially they came from engineering and some people say, well, they're not good enough for real engineering, so they try to apply the science to something else, um, uh, which I think is uh, myself coming from engineering, which is not, not really <laughs> a bad idea. Um, so, um, but I think now, so first, it was more something within science. And why, why was it so successful? Because there was a whole branch of other science really get going into this, like psychology, medicine, biology, and so they all emerged from this. So it was more based on a broad philosoph uh, philosophical change in the sciences um, uh, as such. Um, what is interesting is what we see today, or starting from 1920 and so on, is this idea of applied science. Uh, we had a change in politics uh, since then, which we call kind of um, elitist-based or expert-based um, politics, where, you're not, where you don't have politicians that are really in their field, that have real world experience, but now we have politicians that are really based on expert knowledge of so-called applied science. And now um, this kind of um, science, like the pure science, comes prior to any political decisions by um, making, um, um, by shaping the, the world how politicians should see them. So it's not a, a kind of a politics anymore that is based on real dialogue with political economists. And my guess is that we don't have any kind of abilities and knowledge uh, by politicians anymore who would really like to have political economists like, really uh, arguing uh, with them. Um, so uh, second question, um, how do we get the, um, um, how can we get science or economics back to the statesman? As I just said, I think we have to make changes on both sides. So um, it doesn't really work if you have really trained political economists um, that are uh, willing to dialogue with politicians that have a free will. Um, if uh, you have a, politi a political sphere where we really is just relying on expert knowledge and is just able to make choices based uh, on uh, kind of um, thinking that comes from applied science. And third question is it, re as I did understand, uh, as I did understand it, it's like the fight, um, is it worth within economics? Um, sometimes I'm not really sure. Um, what I think we have to do is really to go back to the basic questions. Do we have a basic theme we want to work on? If you just talk about everything, um, as modern economics is doing based on one uh, kind of thinking. So if you're talking about everything with all different kinds of ways of thinking, it doesn't really work. So I think what we have to really talk about is if we want to become a science that is dealing with basic questions of social wealth, and I would say yes, um, that we should, uh, that should be um, the case if we're talking about political economy, and also, we should be a, a science which is able to reflect the real-world impact it has uh, on uh, aspects of social wealth and the society as a whole. Um, but obviously, as you see, if you, have, if you look back uh, to, to the starting point of our subject uh, with Adam Smith, they didn't have all these distinctions. Ge geography comes later, sociology comes later. So. Um, if you go back to political economy in the sense I've been talking here, you should be prior to all those branching off of the subdisciplines. But I think it's some, something we, we can't really imagine how this should happen. But it's, 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 it's kind of behind or beyond all the subdisciplines, speaking from a historical perspective.
We really have to find a different solution for this. But there's someone up there. <laughs> Um, thank you for your talk. Um, Dirk Inz, an economist from Berlin, and since I'm an economist, I would like to add a little bit. Um, I think neoclassical economics was basically the reaction to Marxist economics. So um, people try to look for some kind of scientific theory that would, them, would allow them not to talk about rents, not to talk about uh, the production process and the capital accumulation and so on, and that is, I think, what, what happened. And I'm not so sure whether you are correct. You, you seem to take uh, the approach that the neoclassical economics took at, at face value, they are, they are pure science approach, but I think it's just posturing. It's just they pretend. They pretend to, to be scientists, but of course they, they come up with these ideas that savings, finance, investment, basically we need the rich because otherwise we, we can grow. All these kind of wrong ideas they incorporated in there. Um, I think that it's a political economy. It's, it's a, a thing that, that basically was happening when there was not yet Marx and the workers and the unions and so on. And then in the 19th, 19th century, when things changed, the rulers uh, of all the big countries basically said, we need economists who, who do not talk about certain things. Um, and um, my question is, are you not over-interpreting this scientific stuff? Because it's, not, it's only meant for posturing, I think. Uh, and my second well, my second question is rather a comment. I, I don't think that political economy died in the 19th century. I think it died in the mid-20th century because there was still the historical uh, school in Germany. There was institutional economics. There was John Maynard Keynes. Uh, all of these people still existed until, until maybe the end of the Second World War. Uh, and then you had the Keynesians. So I, I don't think that that uh, basically political economy died. So if you, I agree completely when you say we, we have to go back. But I think we don't have to go back that far. Of course, it's good to look at the 19th century, but you can also look at, for example, uh, uh, John Kenneth Garbrace, uh, the US institutionalist. He, he published books on economics and the public purpose, which are very good. Um, so, so I wonder whether it's not possible to, to go back not so much into the past. Thank you. Um, st starting with the first, uh, the last question, um, I think, you, yes, you have to go back this far because here it's like really the beginning. And I'm not talking about that as like a, a fixed uh, in, at the starting point of the 19th century. But um, as you can see, and I, I do the research, as, uh, it's also going then to um, the German Historic School and so on. But the basic topics, uh, they're changing as frames are always changing, but they seem to be set since then. Um, so um, I think you should really use like the starting point where it all started off, and then you can just go um, um, go uh, down to the present. But if you just start some uh, like in the 1920s, I think you will miss some something out. Um, talking about Marx, um, I th my guess I, I'm not sure um, would be that this has really been. Um, not, uh, not the basic topic for, for people like Valras, Marshall, and, and so on, um, but it has been used later on. Um, so, so they really wanted, like, uh, especially Valras, he really wanted to create a mathematical school. Um, and then it was used, if you especially think about Milton Friedman and so on, it was used um, to eliminate um, arguments from political economy, from Keynes, and so on. Um, but I think there's, so, so they're different, um, different tracks in, this, uh, in which this developed. And obviously here I've just shown one, but I wouldn't say it's like the only one or the only important one, but like the basic uh, frames um, you can, I, I think at least um, at best or for the first time you can see arising in these texts. Uh, thanks very much for the talk as well. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, because I think we do have this, like, um, well, the development of the discipline itself, then we have, like, the political economic environment, and then we also have the scientific uh, system, which has changed over the course of history, obviously. And my kind of 
fear or doubt is like how to make this change in, a, in the scientific system that we have right now, uh, as we know, like based on all the publications things, and specifically in the economics um, discipline where we now have like those uh, like natural or quasi uh, natural experiment uh, focus, which really takes us even more uh, the political sphere out of um, well political decision making, and just as an example, as you can read in the um, in the Maastricht criteria and uh, the propositions that are being made by the Wirtschaftsweisen uh, in, in Germany, for example, is that you have like an automatic um, um, like an automatic framework that pops in if one country uh, reaches or goes over the, the burden of 60% uh, uh, of, of debt, uh, state debt. So it's getting even worse that the political sphere is not um, regarded as this kind in, in economics. So um, from like where to put this discussion like where to where to get it? Like, is it the Ministry of Science or is it the I don't know what? So that would be my question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think I should say just a few comments on the method. Uh, talking about frame semantics is really to get knowledge that is buried in text, but it's still in the text. So it's not uh, giving historical data to it or any kind of philosophical interpretation, but it's really to see what kind of knowledge has been uh, in the subject at a, at a certain specific uh, time. So, and I think it's quite powerful because um, you really see how these uh, sedimentation can take place over different, um, uh, in, in different uh, years and, and centuries. Um, but obviously, uh, it cannot really explain all those interrelations. So it cannot explain how networks, for example, developed. And it cannot explain uh, how people have been interconnected. So you would have to, um, to interconnect this. What it's really here talk about is the idea of uh, like having a root. So it's uh, giving like neoclassical economics, as I've shown here, I think has made some very basic presuppositions that have not been changed since then. And as you say, they, they're really getting um, in, in, in different uh, categories and angles, and it's really now uh, like a whole branch of different things, but it has like the basic uh, root. And I think it's a powerful, as I see it, if we work with uh, students, for example, uh, talking about this basic motivation, if it's really about, if some, some, somebody really wants to search about truth or about goodness or usefulness, um, and so on. And what I think is also especially, um, trying to find it, um, is about this philosophical understanding. If we really want to search for these kind of universals and to see or to get a, a question of how to deal with free will within the economy. And it's obviously it's not the topic um, that is expressed anymore, but it's underlying a lot of questions we have today. And so I think it's worth just really digging deep to show that there has been uh, a kind of very uh, foundational decision uh, economics could make and which we now seem to be unable to, to address. But it obviously it's just the starting point of, of, of these discussions. Um, I would like to rephrase the question from the colleague from the back. Um, I'm not sure whether the transition from, from what you uh, represent somehow as, um, as, a heg um, as a hegemonical political economy um, to neoclassical economics without looking into the actual social circumstances how it, um, which, which gave rise to the um, neoclassical, to the um, to neoclassical economics as the uh, um, main paradigm, because I, I really uh, agree with the colleague in the back that it was, I mean, you say that um, Varas just wanted a mathematical science, but it, the interesting question would be, um, are the people 
wanted different things, but what gave rise that what was um, idea or perception of science was dominant at that time, and I think really um, that it was the matter that he, he was able, or he and his colleagues were able to um, formulate a science which gets rid of a class conflict, of a distribution conflict between profits and wages. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if your representation of the scientific development is, although you say it's historical, dehistoricizes, dehistoricizes um, science as a social process because um, obviously norms of science change, but the interesting thing is why they change, what are the social circumstances which allow certain norms uh, to become dominant. So, so I think it's a pretty obvious answer. It's just a different kind of research. As I say, you, um, if you try to, uh, what we all also do in Walter Urch, there's uh, to search about the networks um, that make possible that some signs uh, gain power. Um, what I'm talking here, and also in a, histor a historical sense, is the development about the basic language concepts that we can use to express reality. This is why I've talked about the mental maps and what I'm interested here is how these mental maps have been shaped by, by language, uh, by mythical expression and so far. So and I think it can give you, um, if you really talk about mental infrastructures, um, you really have to show what kind of uh, or range of uh, verbal expressions um, uh, are available for, um, for scientists. And what I couldn't show here, but I do in my research, is that I start with these basic texts and then see there's some kind of creativity. So the one talks about a chemist and the next talks about a biologist or a mathematician, but it stays in the range of, of, of science. Um, and there's no one or hardly anyone in this tradition that really can make a step out of this and, and, and talk about a navigator or whatever. So, um, and this is really more uh, um, on the cognitive side, um, explaining how mental infrastructure is developed. And I think it should be always, it's not exclusive. So it should be joined with uh, explanations of how political power or historical circumstances forced why such a language was used and not another. And obviously I cannot explain it. I can just show the mental maps developing and that's it. And I think what I hope is that we have a pluralist economic, economics where we just put this together. So I'm not saying everyone should do frame semantics from now on. This is not my point. But I think if you're not talking about basic mental infrastructures, we won't go really far along because then we cannot make decisions about the language we want to use in order to express what you want, really want to sh search upon. Hello, I'm Stephanie Kunkel. I work at a sustainability research institute in Potsdam. And my question is, how do we um, rework the, the economic thinking in a way that um, it really becomes better than what it is now? Because um, I'm facing a lot, of, um, a lot of questions regarding the the relative importance of socioeconomic and ecological development, um, especially in countries of the global south. And you always have to, um, let's, let's say, explain why you would like to conserve nature uh, if, if it um, impedes the development or the socioeconomic development of a region. So, so there's this constant trade-offs between um, ecology between um, social uh, goals and I'm and when when you say you want to um, reintroduce normativity to the um, to economic thinking I'm I'm just wondering if if we did that if if the outcome was um, was positive in the sense that people would now start to think of ecology and, and social um, social aspect gender equality uh, b because the system as it is now has been very successful and, and people haven't uh, really uh, opposed so much. I mean, there's a, there's a small crowd of people who's against the, the neoclassical thinking, but there's also a big um, mass of people who's, who's in favor of it. So would, would the outcome, if we reintroduced normativity, 
uh, would it be the outcome we, um, I say, all of us would expect and would hope um, it would be? So if you, if you look on, on, on frame semantics, the basic answer would be we, we need a new language, a new practice of language. Uh, and what we have to overcome is obviously that if you talk about normativity or if you talk about practical issues, that is now labeled as being unscientific. This is, I think, is like the best argument that has been found is to say, well, this is just common knowledge or is completely unscientific. And uh, as, as long as this frame stays as, as uh, arts and uh, ethics being unscientific, we won't have any support and no money will be given into it and it will not be incorporated in scientific courses and so on. And I think I just want to show something else. If you, have, if you make frame semantics like this, you have this subordination of things to men's purpose. So the whole dealing of political economy in that time as, as I know it uh, from, from the um, analysis of text is that you have a free will and dealing with, with uh, something that doesn't have a will. And Leon Walras expli explicitly says uh, animals are classified as things of having no will, of having no free will, um, of not being independent and so on. So even in that time um, and even being a practical science, we do not have an idea of uh, nature as a partner or nature as changing in itself um, um, and of dealing with, with uh, something that has a soul, whatever. So this is already completely eliminated if you look from, from other times. And I think this is where we really have to think. It's not worth, uh, if you talk about ecology, just going back to the practical science that has been in place, but it, because it starts from the uh, domination of human um, of humankind over nature and over animals and over the planet, and so I think uh, we really have to uh, see. Or this is what frame semantics can do. It can give you like a, a, a like a um, node where you can then start off and to think. We have really to think out of the box, yeah. And it doesn't really. Uh, it, it's not worth uh, of staying within. Um, economics or even political economy, you have really to do something new and then to see if you can bring in different subjects and so on. Um, now what we have see, now what we have today is uh, that nature is placed in an applied science behind this, where you don't even have a free will to, uh, of human people to change anything. There's really only two people left to ask questions, so then it's perfect. One of them, two. Um, maybe the person in the front starts because he has been very lucky. Yeah. And then you can answer them. Um, Christian Felber, Economy for the Common Good, and also affiliate scholar to the IASS. Um, getting back to the question on Marx and the transition from political economy to economics uh, in the stricter sense. I think it was Alfred Marshall who first used and coined the term economics. And as far as I know, there was a fierce struggle between the pure economists, uh, Walras and Marshall on the one side, and on the other side, uh, Marxist utopians and um, uh, not economists in, the, in this strict mathematical sense. And I'm wondering if uh, the followers of Marx and other utopians reclaimed sufficiently the term of economics. Uh, because as, I've, as far as I remember, Marx did not consider himself as a strict economist, but rather a social scientist. And I hear um, a lot of times talking sociologists and philosophers talking about Marx, <laughs> and not so often economists. And the quest first question is, did uh, alternative political economists sufficiently reclaim the term of economics? Um, the Cusanos Hochschule does not either. You said you're considering um, your science rather a political economy than economics. Now comes my point, going back to the roots, not only of uh, economic science in the stricter sense, but 
uh, to the meaning of the word in ancient Greek, we see three things. We see first that economics or economy does not have to do anything with markets. It's separate from markets, the household. Markets would be agora nomi or agora logi. If it's natural science, agora logi. If it's a social science, agora nomi. Second, it's about sufficiency and abundant means and not about scarce means, very explicitly. So uh, a science that is dealing with scarce means should not call itself uh, economics, but differently. And third, um, in, in the economy and in economics, in ancient economics, money was just the means, but never the goals. If it became the means, it would be grammatistics, but not economics. So my question is, if um, with the aim of going back to the roots, uh, shouldn't we reclaim the term of economics for something different than it is occupied today? And shouldn't we call their science, what you are doing is at best agoronomy and at worst agorology, or actually it's chromatistics in both meanings, but by no means uh, it's economics. <laughs> and what about playing a bit with the words, but looking at the original meanings of all these terms? Um, oh, sorry. Okay, I'll try to be very short. Um, I really enjoyed your analysis of well, Russ, um, and I'll just love the details you had. Um, but considering your your uh, conclusion, I would uh, go a little bit further, um, as I get the idea that you see like pluralism in economics as something com like political econo economics complementary to mainstream economics. But wouldn't be that a contradiction uh, based on, well, the idea of what well, Ross was trying to do, like create a uh, pure science or scientific idea of economics, which uh, basically says that everything else which, it, which does not adhere to this um, strict sense of science is not scientific? I think the two questions are uh, pretty close together. Um, Valras is talking about, uh, he's talking about political economy and, eco uh, and political or economy in the strict sense or the pure sense. And it's only um, Alfred Marshall has shown here that's talking about economics. Um, talking about neoclassical economics, political economy has been the broader term and the prior term. And then economics uh, has been more like an artificial construction. Um, and I think we really can discuss this like for ages. For example, our, uh, our study courses are called economic, pre precisely economics, precisely because, or economy, uh, precisely because of this. But the, the narrow term economic is just really used for mathematical um, expressions of political economy, like the pure thing. So I wouldn't reclaim economic because it's just, or economics, uh, because it's really there um, just to have a very sh narrow meaning. And so there's nothing really to reclaim. Um, so, but the, the question really is, uh, what is worth fighting for and what are the means we have? If you really do you try it as well with the Gemeinwohl economy, um, do you really have the power um, to, to establish a basic frame you can talk about? Um, as we now try with like Gemeinsen economies, which is different from Gemeinwohl. And I think it's a, it's a good point in it, um, but are, where are the means and do we have the power like to reclaim basic narratives as such, basic frames? And so, um, and there we should really see if we can find like a broader term where we can all work together because now it's more like everyone's making his claim um, and uh, taking about frames and frame semantics, it's really about how do we change the basic use of language. It's not writing it down like in a journal article, but how do we change like really the language within economic education and within the economy as a whole. So that would be like the basic thing and I'm, I'm not sure if we found the right term, 
but for me it would be more uh, after studying uh, making this study would be more worth fighting for political economy than for economics. <laughs>